Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for our monthly program at the SoCo. We appreciate your joining us on this lovely Saturday morning. I know that some of you are heading after this straight over to the Tamal Fiesta and Moss for the Chancla throw and the other the other festivities, food, music performances in Santa Clara. And some people are heading out to the Silver City football game. Our team is playing Lovington and they may go to the playoffs. There's a lot going on in our town and we really appreciate you joining us here for the Silver City Museum's monthly community conversation. These programs are co-sponsored by the museum and by Will, the Western Institute of Lifelong Learning and by LULAC the League of United Latin American Citizens. Today we have Dr. Doug Dinwiddie presenting on the topic of frontier justice. He will take us into the early Wild West era of Grant County. I'm Kathleen Norman. I'm the programs coordinator for the Silver City Museum. And this is the third of three programs this fall dealing with government. In the spring, we will continue exploring different aspects of Silver City's essential history, Silver 101, under the topic of community building. We invite you to the museum's Christmas celebration. December 10th is Victorian Christmas and more. There will be food and music and gift opportunities. And then in February, we'll have the Territorial Charter Ball, February 11th. So we have many wonderful things coming up for, the for you from the museum. I'd like to thank the staff museum, the museum staff and the volunteers who all pitched in to bring you this program. It indeed has been an effort and we always enjoy bringing these programs to you. The program is free. But we do suggest a $5 donation. If you have a little extra change in your pocket, we'd appreciate it. If you're interested in joining the museum, there are membership forums up front. We love our volunteers and we're always welcoming more of them. And I'd like to start out now with a little bit of housekeeping. Please mute your cell phones. The bathrooms are on the right-hand side. And while we're using the microphone, we have a policy of wait until the microphone comes to you. And that is so that our people who are listening remotely on Facebook and on Zoom can hear the question and answer. So the program consists of Dr. Dinwiddie presenting on Frontier Justice. Then we'll have a brief pause. And after that, we'll have questions and answers with Dr. Dinwiddie. And then we'll have a panel discussion. We'll have Judge Foy and we'll have Spencer Baca. So, frontier justice. Laws and law enforcement were often an afterthought in young Grant County. Silver City gained its courthouse in 1878. And as the county seat grew, there were judges, justices, and juries who came into play for a range of local matter, matters, mining claim disputes, cattle range conflicts, standard criminal offenses, and the occasional brutal murder. A seasoned educator, Professor Dinwiddie draws from his extensive study and teaching expertise in 19th century topics. Doug grew up in Pinos Altos and graduated from Silver Consolidated Schools. He earned his bachelor's and master's degrees in history from WNMU and his PhD in history and political science from Northern Arizona University. From 1974 to 1987, he served as curator, then director of the WNM Museum. He held the position of professor of social science at the Carlsbad branch of New Mexico State University for 22 years. After a brief stint in Colorado, he returned to his home ground here in Silver City, and he's been involved at the Fort, uh, Fort Bayard for seven years. He's presently the president of the Fort Bayard Historical Pre Preservation Society. Without, without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Dinwiddie. Good 
Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's very nice to uh, have the opportunity to speak with you today. Good to see a lot of uh, familiar faces and and uh, uh, some that I'm not as familiar with, but hope to get to know you as well. Uh, today, we're going to just scratch the surface uh, on the uh, frontier justice system in Grant County. Uh, there's enough uh, uh, to look at that you know, we could go on for many hours, but they say that I should do this in 45 minutes. So, uh, so we're going to uh, take a quick look at it. And uh, if you have some questions afterwards, uh, we'll look forward to trying to uh, answer those for you. I am not advancing my slide here, folks. Uh, here we go. All right, good, thank you. Um, of course, uh, frontier justice uh, brings up the uh, immediate thought of not all of it took place in the courtroom. And uh, uh, certainly uh, Grant County had its share uh, of uh, things going on that were extra legal. And so uh, let's talk about a couple of definitions here. Uh, one definition of the frontier, uh, the place where civilization meets the wilderness, the edge of settlement. In 1890, a scholar uh, presented a paper at the conference uh, and uh, this scholar was Frederick Jackson Turner, who is recognized as one of the great Western historians and in fact, uh, his paper uh, presented what came to be called the Frontier Thesis. And basically, uh, uh, he argued that the frontier was closing in America in 1890, that it existed no more. Well, I would argue that New Mexico never got the memo. Uh, and the frontier certainly persisted well beyond 1890. Uh, in New Mexico. But one of the quotes from Frederick Jackson Turner that we'll be kind of coming back to, uh, for a moment at the frontier, the bonds of custom are broken and unrestraint is triumphant. Uh, so what's justice? Well, uh, there are many diff definitions of justice. This is only one. But Mark Twain had this to say. <laughs> so let's look at New Mexico specifically now. Uh, this gentleman on the screen here is Edmund Ross. He served as territorial governor in New Mexico, uh, 1885 to 89. Uh, Ross is... Uh, was mentioned in uh, uh, John F. Kennedy's Profiles in Cur uh, Courage because it was Ross's vote in the Senate that had actually saved Andrew Johnson from being removed from office uh, when he was impeached. And uh, later on, of course, that was in the 18, late 1860s. And later on, Ross comes to New Mexico as the appointed governor. Bear in mind that uh, territorial governors were appointed by the president. They were not elected. And uh, Ross, after he arrives in New Mexico, uh, had this to say. Uh, Rings of almost every description grew up till the affairs of the territory came to be run almost exclusively for the benefit of combinations of ambitious and unscrupulous Americans. Uh, there's another territorial governor that had a quote that I've always been rather fond of, and, and that was uh, uh, Wallace, Lou Wallace, who said that 
experience anywhere else in the world is of no value in New Mexico. So uh, let's talk a, a minute about uh, this thing with the rings before we go on. The most notorious and powerful of the so-called rings was the Santa Fe ring uh, in uh, the state or territorial capital. And uh, the most powerful person in that ring was Thomas B. Catron, uh, but uh, he had other associates. Uh, they were up to their neck in the Lincoln County War uh, and lots of other uh, uh, territorial disputes in New Mexico. Uh, Catron, by the way, is estimated to have controlled 12 million acres in New Mexico at one time. Uh, and here in the Southwest, uh, Grant County had been created uh, in 1868. <clears throat> and of course, our mines in Grant County were uh, producing a tremendous amount of wealth for the territory of New Mexico. And the early settlers in this area, Silver City comes into existence in 1870. And so it's only two years after Grant County was created. Uh, and the uh, people of this part of the state or the territory uh, were pretty annoyed that the Santa Fe ring pretty much ignored this region and took it for granted and needs and, and uh, desires of the people of this section were ignored. And so in 1876, there was a very strong movement for Grant County to secede from the territory of New Mexico and to attach itself to the neighboring territory of Arizona. And Arizona was fairly friendly to that idea. And it eventually was shot down uh, by the Territorial Committee in the U.S. Congress, and uh, Grant County was not able to secede, but at least they got the attention of the Santa Fe Ring. And as a result, uh, Silver City was granted uh, the permission by the territorial legislature to uh, create its own charter, which was uh, perfected in 1878 and adopted. And from 1878 forward, Silver City has uh, uh, operated under this unique document. And it had all come about largely because of the secession movement that uh, the uh, Santa Fe powers had decided that in order to keep this prosperous area of the territory, they needed to uh, throw Grant County a bone. And uh, the bone was uh, the charter. Uh, and as a result, uh, Grant County is going to have uh, uh, a number of unique features uh, that are not really found elsewhere uh, in the territory. Now, one thing to think about as we examine the justice system uh, is uh, just the vastness of the territory that uh, had to be administered. Uh, you notice that uh, it mentions here on the slide roughly the size of Massachusetts. As created, Grant County included the present day counties, not only of Grant County, but it also included the territory that later became Hidalgo County and Luna County, uh, uh, over 10,000 square miles. So the 1880 census counted 4,530 individuals in Grant County. So about one half person per square mile. Need a lawman? Good luck finding him. Uh, now, one of the interesting uh, 
outcomes of the city of the uh, charter that Silver City was able to adopt in 1878 is among other things that created the office of city marshal. And so you had uh, city marshal and the Grant County Sheriff and jurisdictional questions came up then from time to time as to whose problem is X event. Uh, and it wasn't a problem that was always easily resolved. Uh, and I'm sure our panel may today talk a little bit about that, that uh, jurisdictional issues may still uh, be an issue at times uh, in the justice system. Now, you may recall that uh, uh, Frederick Jackson Turner had written about uh, uh, unrestraint becoming uh, triumphant on the frontier. Here are the tools of unrestraint. Add some of this to the mix. And you have the predictable outcomes. Uh, I remember uh, uh, taking a tour in Lincoln County one time in the uh, community of Lincoln, which was, of course, notorious for its frontier violence. And our historian guide mentioned the fact that, in his opinion, practically everybody in the Lincoln County War was drunk most of the time. And while we don't have any statistics uh, about that in Grant County, I think we can probably uh, assume that quite a bit of the time, some of the people involved had that issue as well. Uh, now, I wanna uh, take a minute here to just mention the source of some of our information. Uh, in the late 1940s and early 1950s, uh, man by the name of Lou Blatchley, uh, who had moved here after he retired from government service. He, had, uh, he was a native of the Western Slope in Colorado, but he had developed respiratory uh, ailments and the doctors advised him if he came back West that he needed to go to a place less cold and less wet than the Western Slope of Colorado. So he had relocated here in Silver City, and he uh, uh, was a man of considerable intellectual energy. And he uh, took a job with the weekly newspaper, the Silver City Enterprise, and his main job was selling ads. But he soon became interested in the stories that he kept hearing from old timers. And he started writing a series of articles that appeared in the uh, Silver City Enterprise starting in 1949. And for a while, he traveled around uh, southwestern New Mexico uh, in the company of a stenographer who would uh, keep notes on, on the interviews that he was doing with old timers. That became prohibitively expensive by the time he paid the stenographer, and somebody suggested to him that maybe he should use one of these newfangled instruments that were just coming into the hands of the public, the tape recorder. Apparently, there was one tape recorder in Silver City at that time, and it belonged to Eddie Ward, who was the manager of the Gila Theater, competitor of the Silco. And Eddie Ward was persuaded by Lou Blatchley to loan him his tape recorder. And that was the beginning. And over the next several years, Blatchley filled over 800 reel-to-reel -reel tapes with the recollections of about 100 old timers, not only in the Silver City area, but he went as far afield as West Texas and uh, Northern Arizona to uh, capture the recollections. So some of the stories I'll be sharing with you today are thanks to the work of Lou Blatchley, who was one of the earliest of what we today call oral historians. And uh, 
I also want to take time to uh, just mention that uh, my work in, in the area with preserving those tapes and the information on them was when I left the area for another position in uh, the late 1980s, uh, Pat Humble and Terry Humble uh, kind of picked up uh, the task and we owe a lot to the Humbles for uh, what they did to preserve uh, and, uh, and, and protect uh, the information that Lou Blatchley had gathered. Uh, by the way, the original tapes were taken to the University of New Mexico Zimmerman Library. And it's a long, long story about uh, getting copies of them available here. So I won't go into that, but I just wanna talk about some of the information that was captured in those tapes. One of the quotes from, from Marvin Poe, who was a cowboy uh, who had worked for several ranches in New Mexico in the late 1800s and early 1900s, uh, was this quote from him that it was nothing to see a man killed in them days. And Poe went on to recount uh, the killings of at least 14 men that he had witnessed. The survivors uh, of the scrapes uh, would sometimes find themselves in need of legal counsel now. And this is just an example from a Silver City newspaper in the 1890s. And thought it's interesting here. We have ads from 13 different barristers uh, in the newspaper. By contrast, there was one dentist and four doctors uh, who had bought ads. So uh, I suppose we could extrapolate that you're 13 times more likely to need a lawyer than a dentist. Now, who were the frontier lawyers? Uh, oftentimes, these are people with not a great deal of legal background. Uh, the typical way you became a lawyer uh, on the frontier uh, was to, of course, pass the territorial bar examination. And you prepare for that oftentimes by doing what was called reading law. And reading law would oftentimes involve being a clerk in a practicing attorney's office and carrying out duties that uh, in some uh, instances today are carried out by paralegals, uh, et cetera. You know, Abraham Lincoln never went to law school. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was, uh, remember, self-taught. And uh, he uh, read law in, a, in a, an attorney's office in Springfield, uh, Illinois, and eventually, of course, became a well-known lawyer in that state. Uh, so it was pretty typical that people would get into the law that way. Uh, according to one source I was looking at, uh, by the 1850s, uh, it's estimated that there may have been a dozen law books in the entire territory of New Mexico. Uh, and so a lot of it was sort of uh, best guess. By the time we get to the Silver City era uh, and the town charter and so forth, things were looking up a little, but it still was quite common to have people uh, practicing law who, with very little formal training in the law. Uh, then of course you have frontier judges. This is uh, a, uh, a painting of the famous uh, Judge Roy Beans headquarters over in West Texas. Uh, and uh, you notice that the courtroom is a saloon uh, and uh, a lot of uh, Bean's decisions have been written up by, by historians. Uh, and one of the things that Bean did that I'm sure a lot of other frontier lawyer, uh, frontier judges 
were obliged to take account of as well is uh, Bean would always look around the courtroom during uh, as the trials proceedings commenced and determine uh, who all was in the courtroom to support whom and most of them were armed. And so the judge would kind of know what the odds were as the uh, trial proceeded uh, as to what maybe his decision should be. Uh, and there's a, a famous case with being that had involved the killing of a Chinese railroad, uh, railroad worker. Uh, and uh, he'd been killed by a, a white man and the, the defendant was in the courtroom with a lot of his friends uh, sporting their weapons. And when Judge Bean handed down his uh, decision, he said that he had consulted his law books and he found numerous references to the killing of individuals, but not a one of them addressed the killing of a Chinaman. So he declared the man not guilty. Then there's the case here in New Mexico territory where uh, a judge had given a pretty good dressing down to the lawyers in the room. And one of the lawyers replied, your honor, don't be too hard on the lawyers. You may be your one yourself someday. All right, well, what about the lawmen who are tasked to, uh, to enforce the law. Silver City was blessed with a pretty capable lawman throughout most of its territorial period. And the most uh, well-known of them was Harvey Whitehill. Uh, Whitehill was a very early resident of Silver City, came here in its uh, earliest days and uh, through uh, likability and ability, uh, he was soon elevated to the position of sheriff. And he and his chief deputy became kind of the territorial version of the good cop, bad cop situation. And his chief deputy was Dan Tucker throughout much of uh, the time. Now, Dan Tucker was known as Dangerous Dan Tucker. He sometimes was also called Shotgun Dan Tucker because of his preferred weapon. Uh, and writer Bob Alexander, who's written books on both White Hill and, and Dan Tucker, uh, states that uh, by Tucker's own count, he was obliged to kill eight men in Grant County alone. Uh, and these incidents are documented. There was one case here in Silver City where uh, a fellow had been chunking rocks at passersby. Uh, and uh, some of those rocks had, had found their mark and, and Tucker went out to address the situation and the guy threw a rock while Tucker was confronting him. So Tucker killed him. And so you learned you didn't throw rocks in Silver City. Uh, on another occasion, remembering now that dimming was still part of Grant County until after 1900. And Dan Tucker was sent to Deming because uh, of uh, the need for a lawman there. And he went uh, there and there was uh, one cowboy who had ridden his horse into the Harvey house and was shooting uh, through the ceiling and generally creating mayhem. And Dan Tucker walked in and blew him away with his shotgun. And they said Deming got a lot calmer uh, uh, after that. So, uh, so definitely Tucker was one of these fellows uh, not to be trifled with. Uh, now about courthouses, uh, the first courthouse in Grant County was in Santa Clara. 
Uh, in those days, it was called Central City or just Central. And it had grown up to serve Fort Bayard. And uh, the first courthouse in Grant County was there and it still stands uh, today. And uh, it's on Maple Street. And by the way, if you ever want to uh, walk around historic Santa Clara, you can go in the city hall uh, there and pick up a copy of these uh, a Santa Clara walking tour, and it'll guide you around to a number of the historic buildings in the village, including this courthouse. Second courthouse uh, was in Pinos Altos. This building still stands as well. It's a private residence. Uh, it sits right next to Bear Creek, and many of you are familiar with the Buckhorn uh, Restaurant Saloon. And if you go about 400 yards north from the Buckhorn, you will come to this building. And uh, yeah, again, it was the second courthouse in Grant County. Uh, when the county seat was moved here to Silver City, uh, at first they rented various spaces around uh, to serve as the courtrooms. Uh, but in 1885, as a sign of its uh, growing prosperity, uh, Silver City constructed uh, a courthouse that stood on the site of today's courthouse, which replaced it uh, in starting in 1929. Uh, and the cost of, of this building, as you see, was just over $22,000. Well, sometimes justice in the eyes of the community was not to be carried out according to the rules. And uh, there were times that uh, people thought the wheels of justice were moving far too slowly. Uh, an example, again, an area that's no longer part of Grant County, but was then, uh, the uh, a town of Shakespeare uh, in 1881. Uh, you have two horse thieves uh, who had been uh, incarcerated uh, in the jail waiting for the circuit judge to appear. And a mob decided that they weren't going to wait and they strung up uh, uh, these two outlaws, Sandy King and Russian Bill. Uh, and did it uh, right there in the Grant Hotel uh, in Shakespeare. Now, lynchings didn't always go according to plan. Uh, Gary Larson in the far side had one version of what might happen. Things went wrong. Uh, but the, the story of Joel Fowler, and it's recounted in the in, in the Blatchley interviews. A uh, man by the name of Montague Stevens, who wrote a book called Meet Mr. Grizzly. And uh, Montague Stevens was in his 90s when Blatchley interviewed him, and he was an eyewitness to the lynching of Joel Fowler. Joel Fowler was uh, a notorious killer who some people estimate had killed dozens of men, uh, often on a contract hit basis. And Fowler had murdered a man in cold blood in a saloon in Socorro in front of witnesses and had been incarcerated in the Socorro jail, which had a dirt floor. And it was reported that Joel Fowler had almost escaped by digging a hole in his cell floor and had almost made it when he was discovered. And some of the citizens of Socorro decided that uh, that was a real security risk. And so they decided to go ahead and uh, take care of the Joel Fowler situation uh, before it uh, got out of hand anymore. 
So they, uh, a mob got Fowler, they took him down to the local hanging tree in Socorro. They stood him up in the back of a wagon and they drove the wagon off. And when Joel Fowler fell, it was discovered that somebody had miscalculated the distance and Joel Fowler landed on his tiptoes. So rather than recover the wagon and start all over again, somebody got the idea, you know, if we just pick up his feet and then a bunch of other guys jump on him, that'll get the job done. And so Montague Stevens said he witnessed that, that that's exactly how they finished the job uh, on Joel Fowler. Uh, by the way, spe just speaking of jails and jail security, uh, jails were not particularly secure. And you may know that Billy the Kid escaped from the Silver City Jail by climbing out the chimney. Uh, and uh, his first of many escapes. Now, in 1883, there is an incident uh, at Gage. Uh, Gage is circled here on this map. The uh, Southern Pacific Railroad had completed its transcontinental path uh, through Deming and onto the West Coast in 1880. Silver City got its railroad three years later when a spur came up from Dimming to Silver City. Uh, and uh, of course, trains had introduced a brand new temptation for outlaws, uh, for robbery. And uh, there's a robbery of the, the train at Gage uh, in November of 1883 that also resulted in the murder of the engineer on the train. Uh, and uh, for a while, there was a mystery about uh, who the perpetrators were, but through a series of clues, Sheriff Whitehill was able to track down one at a time, the members of the gang. And uh, the leading, leader of the gang was an outlaw by the name of Kit Joy. And Kit Joy and three others were eventually put in jail here in Silver City and charged with robbery and the murder of the engineer. But in March of 1884, they broke out of the jail and they went to the nearby Elephant Corral, which was on Hudson Street, and uh, secured horses and headed out, escaping from town. But by then, somebody had noticed, and there were shots fired after them. And soon there was a posse on the trail. They they chased these four outlaws uh, to the east, a ways, and then they turned north toward the Pinos Altos Mountains. They chased them further, eventually caught up with them, and in the ensuing gunfight, one member of the posse was killed, uh, and three members of the outlaw gang were killed, but not Kit Joy. Kit Joy himself survived to be brought back to jail, convicted, uh, and sentenced to prison, uh, and Kit Joy eventually uh, serves uh, about 11 years before he was eventually released uh, from prison uh, and uh, lived out his life as a free man. Uh, Fort Baird had introduced a, a whole different uh, element into the region. You have all the soldiers out there uh, and uh, uh, some of them came to Silver City to party, but most of them went to the nearby village of Central City, as Santa Clara was known then. And uh, one of and Central City became rather notorious for its uh, uh, criminal activity. And one of the events that happens out there uh, in 1885 
is a band who had been awarded the Medal of Honor for previous uh, work in Arizona. Uh, he and a fellow soldier had a dispute over a lady of the evening. And uh, the soldier who felt offended and, and uh, disappointed had shot uh, Sergeant Bowman. Uh, and his defense was that it was an accidental shooting that his gun fell out of his hand and hit the ground. Well, the, the jury didn't buy it. Uh, and uh, he was uh, convicted of, of killing Bowman. But one of the most interesting aspects of this trial that was reported in the local papers was the hungry juror who said that he really wasn't that convinced of the private's, uh, Private O'Donnell's guilt, but it, he was hungry, it was supper time, and it seemed to him they were never gonna get supper unless they reached a verdict. So he said, so that he could eat supper, he said he voted guilty also. Uh, but uh, sounds like a peelable convention, uh, conviction there, but anyhow, uh, O'Donnell eventually is sentenced to jail and he's released after eight years. Then there's the story of Ada Holmes. Ada was a piano player in the Monarch Saloon in Silver City. And she became infatuated with a man by the name of Jack Brown. Unfortunately for Ada, Jack was married and had uh, children, in fact. And Jack uh, eventually got around to telling Ada that he couldn't be with her. He was going to have to uh, stay with his wife. So Ada was not happy. And she took a pistol to the Centennial Saloon, where Jack was known to frequent. And in front of many witnesses, she shot Jack and killed him. Uh, Ada was then uh, convicted of murder uh, in uh, a courtroom in Silver City uh, the, and was sentenced to three years. And uh, the editor of the Lordsburg Liberal newspaper uh, said that this was an outrage and that in his opinion, Ada should have been tried by Judge Lynch. Uh, Ada eventually became a newspaper sensation in the ter territorial uh, penitentiary in Santa Fe. She was the only female inmate at the time uh, and uh, later is reported to have had affairs with the warden and the assistant warden. Uh, state pin. Uh, eventually, Ada was uh, released, and her last known address was Creed, Colorado, and nobody knows what became of her after that. Uh, today, if uh, you want to go online and look up this episode uh, on Investigation Discovery Channel, Deadly Women, Lovers Make Three. It's a three-parter that deals with three different incidents in, in uh, the United States. And one of them is the Ada Holmes story. Uh, so even today, the story of Ada Holmes is still being talked about. Uh, and uh, when you tune that in, I will advise you ahead of time that you'll have to believe that Silver City sits among the Segoros. Uh, one of the often discussed issues is, uh, is there really just one justice system or is there justice for people depending on who they are? And an example of this in the 1890s uh, was the uh, well-known and some would say notorious cattleman, Tom Lyons, who shot and killed his wife's lover uh, in their living room here in Silver City. Uh, and uh, it was uh, quickly decided that this was justifiable homicide and, uh, and Tom 
uh, was exonerated for this killing. But of course, the barroom pianist uh, had gotten three years. Here's an example of an attorney who actually shot and killed the town marshal. Uh, and uh, his name was uh, Fielder and uh, the town marshal uh, Cantley had uh, been loud and abusive toward the attorney in a local watering hole and uh, the uh, testimony was that the town marshal had it coming and so uh, the lawyer was quickly exonerated uh, for shooting and killing Marshal Cantley. Then there's the story of Tom Darnell. Uh, again, this is a, a story that is told in the Blatchley tapes. Darnell was uh, a cowboy who had been recruited, had signed up for the Rough Riders. And in fact, he became known as the best Bronco buster in the Rough Riders. And in Teddy Roosevelt's book about the Rough Riders, there's a photo of Tom Darnell riding a bronc uh, and uh, and Roosevelt praises him effusively as, as being the best horseman he had ever seen. But Tom Darnell was also a mean man. And that's how he was described by people who talked about him to Blatchley. Uh, one witness said that Tom Darnell was a real wampus cat and he was always stirring up a fuss. Uh, and Darnell's end came in a bar in Central. Uh, he had just been fired from his job as a cowboy in the Diamond A for threatening other cowboys and was drowning his sorrows at the bar in Central and uh, became angry at the bartender and decided that he was going to kill him. And he had left his weapon out on the, uh, uh, on a horse outside. So Darnell goes out and he straps on his pistol, comes back into the room. And now the bartender has run away and, but the proprietor of the saloon is now behind the bar. And Darnell asks him, where'd that so-and-so go? I'm going to kill him. And he said, no, you're not. You're not going to kill anybody. And he tried to give Darnell a bottle and just tell him to leave. And Darnell said, well, I guess I'll just have to kill you then. And Darnell reached down and grabbed his sweater. It was in the month of February. It was cold. He was wearing a thick, heavy sweater. As he pulled the pistol from its holster, he hung the hammer of the pistol in his sweater. And while he was attempting to dislodge it, the saloon keeper retrieved his own weapon from under the bar and shot and killed Tom Darnell. Uh, and uh, again, uh, justifiable homicide uh, since Darnell was trying to kill him. Well, statehood comes finally in 1912 and New Mexico is admitted as the 47th state. I know all of us have experiences where we run into people who haven't got the message on that, uh, but, uh, but it truly did occur. Uh, and as part of becoming a state, New Mexico had to adopt a new constitution which established a new system of laws and courts in New Mexico, and it was now ready to move on to its next phase. Uh, and that is going to use the available time I have today uh, to talk a little bit about early law in Silver City. Okay. Uh, well, starting with part two of our program, we've got questions and answers with our speaker, Doug Dinwiddie. And just a, just a reminder about microphone etiquette, please wait to 
speak until we hand you the microphone, and that's for the benefit of the people who are listening remotely on Zoom and Facebook. So who's going to start off with a question about frontier justice? You, uh, very interesting stuff. Thank you, Doug. Um, I wonder, you didn't mention any uh, Hispanic murderers or victims and so on. Um, was this sort of stuff going on among the Hispanic population of the territory as well? Yes, it was. And, and in fact, uh, one of the aspects of, of uh, frontier justice, there was a, a, a deep element of racism uh, in it. And in fact, uh, some of the people that Dan Tucker killed uh, were Hispanics. Uh, and uh, it, uh, the population uh, was uh, often, uh, of course, uh, it's not unusual that Silver City was like most Western communities, that the uh, dominant uh, a political uh, organization, including your uh, constables and, and sheriffs and marshals and so forth were dominated by the Anglo uh, uh, group. And uh, even the newspapers that reported things uh, oftentimes uh, uh, treated the, the Spanish-speaking population as uh, uh, invisible basically. And a lot of what went on with them was uh, never even recorded. Yeah, my experience with the newspapers here, they were edited by and for Anglos, and they generally just did not report news about Hispanics at all. Right. Uh, for example, during the influenza epidemic of 1918, 1919, they just didn't report Hispanic deaths. Practically all the deaths reported in those newspapers, the Enterprise and the Independent then, were just in the Anglo community. So, and there was no Spanish language newspaper in Grant right. County to fill in those gaps. So all of that is just lost to history, essentially. Yeah, and, and you'll notice that in other parts of the territory, for example, in Las Vegas, New Mexico, there was a, uh, and in Santa Fe, there were Spanish language newspapers that, that did not exist uh, in the Southern part of the territory. Even Lou Blatchley, I mean, his stuff is great, and I, I hope it will be used more than it has been. But even there, he interviewed maybe three Hispanic people right. or four, something like that. So even with him talking to the old timers in the 50s, right. there is still that blank space. Right. Uh, yeah. Good point. Another question? Doug, great presentation. And I was curious about mining because Josiah Royce uh, in his uh, dissertation from, from Cal Berkeley, um, he's a philosopher in Harvard later on, uh, wrote a terrific book about the mine, mine uh, claim jumping in uh, California during the uh, uh, 18... 48 um, um, gold rush and had the uh, U.S. Um, Mining Act changed that and as a result did Grant County have the problems of claim jumping and uh, irregularities in, in the mining districts that uh, that existed in California and Nevada? I, I don't know enough about those other places uh, uh, to compare them, but I can tell you that it was still an issue. Uh, and uh, generally anything that, that uh, involves profit and money is going to invite uh, uh, conflict. And oftentimes uh, uh, the mining claims were uh, an issue. 
Uh, and, and again, I, I think from my research anyway, a, a lot of it is not much has been written in that. There's probably room for some scholarship uh, to look into that uh, more in this area, because certainly the resources I'm aware of don't deal that much with that aspect of it. But, uh, but it certainly was uh, still uh, an issue. And in fact, it was mentioned to me at the break that, that perhaps one of the reasons we find so many lawyers in Silver City was not because they were all defending murderers, uh, uh, but that uh, a lot of them were probably involved in mining issues and mining claims uh, and land uh, litigation uh, and that sort of thing. So uh, uh, I think, again, I think that's an aspect of, of it that uh, uh, could use some further investigation. Good question. Anybody else have another question? What about the uh, comparison? What about a comparison of the uh, violence uh, pre-Civil War, frontier violence pre-Civil War compared to post-Civil War? I suspect that there was some post-traumatic stress disorders among the soldiers that, that fought in the war. You know, that's a, a, a good good point, but I, I think that, uh, of course, in the case of New Mexico, uh, we have uh, Grant County, for example, isn't doesn't even exist uh, prior to the Civil War. It comes into being afterwards. But if you look at the territory as a whole and the West uh, as a whole, uh, it would be hard to imagine that uh, the situation was particularly uh, better before the Civil War. Uh, one thing is just the number of people uh, and the more people that you had in a region. In, interesting, there's a lot of cattle seeding. Oh, okay. Yes, I, I, I just ended a lot of cattle rushers back in my day, and we do get some of those cases. And uh, I haven't seen a horse seeding case beyond the ever, but there's been a lot of, uh, of, uh, of cattle seeding. We actually have, we actually have, uh, uh, like the cabinet set, and, and they go to great lengths to try to make sure we don't have a lot of cases there. It's so often, you know, they'll be cases that come through on the IRS and, uh, and that kind of thing. Um, you know, we have, we have your, your bar shootouts that happen, uh, that happens here, then you work. Uh, you have all that kind of thing. But right now, really, in all honesty, everything is very subtle. Uh, everything right now is incredibly subtle. Yeah, there's two judges here in Silver City. There's, there's me and the two. And we are handling here at this point 294 judge cases of the at this point. By the end of the year, you know, we probably will over 200. I would anecdotally, but I haven't sat down like in, like I would do if I was interested in doing some kind of solid paper and do you know real real research to come from that as I stand here and not begin. But I can tell you anecdotally that I would say 70% of the people that I see uh, in criminal cases involving felony action in, in this district. Uh, I think are are either substance abuse related, alcohol related um, uh, cases, and that's just the way it is. Sheriff Gomez was quoted in the recent Citizen Press uh, as saying um, he was responding to some criticism about the high Case that happened recently. And um, you mentioned that it was involved with passing the use of that. So I'm interested in, in your opinion, um, Your Honor, and then turn it back on that. 
Can we replace the question? I talk to balls and I talk to stuff. I talk the way I see it. Sometimes people don't agree with the way I see it. Most times when people use my story, they're sitting with them. So that's our position. There's got to be someone who has a few rather than going out in the, in the street like they did back in the day, pulling out their guns and killing each other. There's got to be someone who can say, no, this is what we have to do. And that's me. Better or worse, that's what it is. Right. Catch and release is a term in my mind um, that is brought forth for political purposes. All right. And I'm not a politician. I'm a judge. And what I tell people is this you all, you, you make the law, you tell them what the law is, and I'll apply it. That's what I do. Now, historically, I'm going to tell you about this catch and release. It's following tax bonds. Right? And that is that if you get accused of a crime, a cash bond is set up. And if you get out, if you want to get out of jail, you've got to set up the bond. Cash bond or sure your bond and so forth. So cash bond or get a bond is for it. Okay. That's true. In New Mexico, that's tremendously um, Yeah. So because it's changed, because the theory behind it was. That just because you're poor, you shouldn't be kept in jail. We need to go to a risk based method of determining who gets released and who doesn't from, from, from jail pre, pre, uh, pre condition. Right? And keep in mind, pre condition, I didn't make these rules. But you know, America lives by the adage, by the adage of we are innocent until we are proven guilty. I didn't make that's not my rule, that's the way it is. All right. And so we decided we don't want to put people in custody before they're convicted. You want to change that? Change it. That's fine. You tell me what the rules are, I'll apply it. Okay. But that's that's the start. All right. So once we start with that, then we think there are people who need not be out and about in public, at even 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 though they haven't been convicted, because the charges are serious, they're very dangerous. So they're Rules that we take into account in determining who should be released, who should not. For the most part, ladies and gentlemen, most everybody gets released. Out of, out of those 394 cases, um, there are very few cases where people are not released. Right? Now, if I had a crystal ball and I could tell you this guy wasn't going to go out and do something in the future, I, would, I wouldn't let that happen. That's it. Right? If I knew, if I had, if I had the foresight, I wouldn't do that, but I don't. I don't know what people do. All I can do is take the information that's given to me and make a decision. And, and the rule is unless you're dangerous, there's a, there's a process that you're not going to be tested. Okay? And so, when they talk about catching the leads, is people get arrested for crimes, they go in front of the magistrate, not me, the case who starts in magistrate, and then the magistrate says, Says an unsecured bond with conditions of release, including now we have a blue cross service that actually watches to figure out. Right. So uh, that's the system that we're under. And I have held people uh, free condition that I believe are dangerous. I have done that. But I have released many more because, quite frankly, that's the system. And what I tell people is when they blame voice of the and they're not there and that's the problem. That you make the rule, you tell me what the rule is not all I'm doing is apply the law that see it. 
unjustly or unfairly, or there's going to be people that get out and go and commit other heinous crimes, right? Um, and just last thing, I think that there's been a few studies done, and I think we're very long way uh, away from ever putting this into uh, practice, but there have been some folks who create algorithms and compare the algorithm's prediction of who's dangerous with a judge's prediction of who's going to reoffend. And there are some believers that a algorithm would be able, better able than a judge to predict who should get a uh, pre-trial release and who should it. Um, and, you know, I think that uh, we could be going more that way in the future. I mean, that, that's a less surprising thing to happen. Oh, does it work? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Take it as a topic. That way? Yeah. Okay. When my husband and I moved to Silver City in what year was it? 69. 69. Uh, we decided, or he decided to work here at Western as a history teacher. And before we came here, we got the local papers. We were living in Albuquerque University, and there was no, there was so much controversy about this woman, a Mildred Cousy, Cousy, and I just wondered why something like this could have been in the papers for so long, and she must have been in operation for such a long time. Why all of a sudden was it illegal? their whole situation and do we have anything like this going on today? You're talking about Madam Milby. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, through legislative action, it was made illegal. Prostitution was made illegal, right? Um, 
And so I was going to say that it, as we were, it, it, the, the main presentation, you know, was reminding me how uh, interesting our history is. And down at the, the Silver City Museum, there is a ton of interesting books about our history. Uh, there's a few on Madame Millie and the houses of prostitution that were booming in Silver City um, back in the day. And there's also uh, a, a few books about um, sanctioned hangings, right? Uh, and the documented ones and, and stuff like that. So, yeah, I guess, I don't know if I have a great answer to your question, right? Um, but I just would say that something that strikes me was we were talking about the you know lack of history of Hispanics, right? Lack of recorded history. And I think it's interesting that that still very much is a case. Um, we have a lot of interesting figures in the legal community, interesting cases, uh, you know, interesting crimes that do not get formally recorded. And, you know, sometimes I think you have a lot of history that's being lost in Southwest New Mexico. Um, and then also saying that it was, you know, controversial for uh, Milton running her business, right? It was a salacious thing. Um, and I think maybe in some respects that hasn't changed so much with women who are accused of committing crime. Um, I, I thought it was interesting with Ada Holmes, I think that was the name, and it was framed as though she had an affair, right? Today you would call that rape if jailers had sex with her. It would be sexual assault, right? But I think that when we see women who are accused of crimes or involved in crimes, you know, in some capacity, a lot of times we still do see media publications and even with, you know, how they're charged uh, by the district attorney overblown and made into a, you know, uh, salacious thing. Um, from my perspective, I know of no um, underground um, house of ill repute in either Branson or Hidalgo County at this time. I'm unaware of it. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means that I'm 60 years old and I'm unaware of it. <laughs> um, I haven't had a case where there's been an allegation of prostitution in the years that I've been discussing this one on five. Okay. So the answer to that question is it hasn't come in that form. Um, there's I've, I've had a number of cases where sexual assault is alleged. But it, uh, and there's an allegation that, and, and, and somehow the defense is that the alleged victim is some, somehow should have, uh, you know, she, cons she consented. She's saying she didn't consent, and, uh, and, and just be blunt about it that, uh, that, you know, that that person, that the, that the victim, Doesn't matter. Uh, sexual assault, sexual assault. Uh, that's where I see it. But I don't see it in, in like, in, in Madam, with, with Madam Millie. I think that, that was even before my time. And I'm like six, 60 years old when she was, because that would have been like the early, late 60s, early 70s. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's, uh, that's, the issue there, I think, was the, the issue of non enforceability, of, of not enforcing. I'm sure it was illegal. I'm sure it was, uh, I'm, I'm sure that, uh, that, that it's a law that could have been enforced. And I ventured against it at that point in time, whatever it was with the power to be, they chose not to enforce it. That's the way I see it. Uh, is it right? But uh, I don't think we have that now. I, I just haven't seen that before. 
what I what I've been involved in in all these years. So I think we have time for only one or two more questions, and Doug has been waiting patiently up here. He's got a question. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, uh, in, in doing my research, I came across this problem of jurisdiction and so forth. And is that still an issue if you, you encounter that? I, I'll speak at it because I was also the district attorney here for a while. And the, problem with it, that, that. the issue, you don't have a problem with jurisdiction because if a crime is committed in the sixth division, then it's brought to us. But where the issue arises, quite honestly, is in what I call collaboration between law enforcement. So um, there, there's always been issues involving collaboration with law enforcement. And it being my case, and I'm not telling you about the case, but that's been the story forever for, 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 for quite a number of years. It's gotten a lot better as time gone on. I think that there's a lot better collaboration now between all of the departments than there were previously. Um, but it, it's more of a collaborative issue. Will, will, will we work together to bring the case to the top? Versus, uh, you know, it's our jurisdiction or your jurisdiction. No, really, it's the jurisdiction of the court, the court in Jack County. If it's happening in Jack County, then, um, then it's, it's going to be brought. Where it's going to be investigated by who is what the issue and, and I think that's where you get into those issues. If it happens in the county, the county's going to do it. If it happens in the city, so the city's going to do it. If it happens there, their police are going to do it. And then you've got the state police. Um, and, uh, but, but it does exist because I can remember when I was district attorney, this was a long time ago, um, we had a, a murder out in. Out on the roadway between uh, where the hot springs is, out there, out there, somebody, and I don't think they've ever solved it, but somebody just killed this guy. He was walking down the road and just killed him. And it was really sad. The guy was working, he was a, uh, a worker who was just basically going to work at the ranch that he worked at forever and ever and ever. And he was walking to, to the ranch, and whoever drove by killed him. And it was very sad. But where we had the division, Talk about is who's going to who's going to investigate it? Is the county going to investigate it? Is the state police? Going to investigate it? Because both have jurisdiction, right? This the county has jurisdiction in anything that happens in the county. This happens in the county. The state police have jurisdiction over anything that happens in the state. It happens in the state. So then we have to decide which the two is going to investigate. And uh, I ended up making that decision. I picked the, the, the sheriff. There, there is one off uh, our Zoom. Again, a dozen people on Zoom joining us. So Dave Becker is asking, uh, and, it, and it's probably for Doug. It goes back over 150 years again. Uh, so it, he's asking in the very early period of frontier justice overlapped with the period of uh, the wars against the Apache. And he's wondering if indigenous people were brought into the judicial or the justice system, or was it all dealt with by the military or how did that? One thing that I can comment on there is the county commission in Grant County in the early 1880s offered bounties for Apache scouts. Uh, and it was an extreme reaction to uh, uh, warfare with the Apaches and Rady, that civilians did not believe that the army uh, or the law enforcement mechanism was dealing sufficiently with protecting the people. So they subscribed to the idea that the extermination of the Apaches would be a suitable solution to the problem. And they adopted uh, uh, this idea of proof of killing uh, by uh, offering money. And this is something, of course, the Mexican government had done very early on. 
uh, and to the best of uh, anyone's knowledge that I've ever seen, no one ever collected a bounty from the Grant County Commission for preventing an Apache scout. But uh, to the extent that that involves the legal system uh, and, uh, and the Apache issue, uh, otherwise it was left in the purview of the Army and the Indian Bureau uh, to uh, enforce uh, rule upon the native people. I just thought I'd make a comment about the question of Millie as someone who grew up here. And one of the reasons I think that in the paper a lot is it was pretty common for the press to print after the raid the names of the gentlemen that had been um, found out during the raid. And I mean, even as a child, I can remember when that would happen. And, you know, friends of my parents, one of the men had been um, caught at Millie. So that may have been part of why it was always a topic of discussion, because literally the press would print the names during after the raid. The press was sensationalized. One more question? Going back to the pre-statehood territorial basis, how did they determine who served in the justice system? What qualifications or experience led to people serving as judges or prosecutors or what have you? It was very hit and miss in the territorial uh, period. Most jobs, in the territorial era were decided primarily through patronage. Uh, basically, uh, who, if you knew somebody, you know, that you could get an appointment. And this was true right down to district judges. For example, if, if, uh, if you were not affiliated with the Santa Fe Marine from about the late 1860s to well into, well, let's say 1900. If you did not have connections with the Santa Fe Marine, you were not gonna get a territorial position. Um, and down at the more local level, uh, of course, uh, it, it, uh, who you knew was oftentimes uh, localized that you could get appointments to local positions by uh, similar arrangements with local politicians. Okay. Any final question? Yeah. I have one very generalized question and it may be inappropriate for this venue, but um, having lived elsewhere where Police forces are not as broken up as they are here, where you don't have your public hand transport police, your university police, your local police, your sheriff, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm wondering if you have a, or would like to make a comment as to whether you think this system works better or would we be better off with a more generalized single police force. It really is. I mean, I never thought about that, but I've got to tell you, I, I probably would, at this juncture, then, or lean toward, and I need to think about this, I'd I, 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 lean probably or I like the fact that we have local departments because I think that by having local departments, you have local people who know local people. One of the problems that you get when you know you have one generalized police force, you don't necessarily have, you know, the chief of police in Barrett is in Barrett, uh, which I don't know if the chief of police in Santa Clara is in Santa Clara, 
but the chief police in silver lives in silver. And, and so I think that you, you, you get to know your people and, and so you can do a better job because I believe that life is about relationships. And, and you're able to deal with, with, with people that you know better than someone you may know. And so my initial, I really didn't think about it a little longer, but my initial thought is kind of like, but it's a, that's a really good question. <laughs> Yeah, and I agree with a really good question, and it makes me think, uh, I would tend to think a more generalized central power for healthcare would work, right? I've never thought about that translating to law enforcement, um, and um, there would be some benefits. The, I think that the, the risk and red flag that jumps out of you is if there is corruption, right? There's no checks or balances which would, I think would be an issue. Um, so yeah, I think, I mean, I'm, obviously I have to be biased, right? Because this is the water I swim in. Um, but I think that like the answer to, or the cure for things that are lost in translation between departments and, uh, you know, the jurisdiction issues, or some departments that are under trained or under resourced so they can't handle investigation is that there just needs to be better collaboration and, and communication between departments. But they should still remain separate. Thank you, Senator. Well, I think with that, we're going to conclude the program. Thank you, everybody, for enjoying joining us. Just to, to mention upcoming programs, we do have the Victorian Christmas at the museum on December 10th. So please join us for that. And Melody, our gift shop owner, wanted me to remind any museum members you get 20% off on a purchase of Christmas items. So thank you again. And uh, thank you for the team. Thank you so much, Sarah, for handling the mic. Thank you, Javi and Marcus, for handling the technical. And it just truly takes a village. Thank you, Bart, for guiding these programs along. And of course, thank you to our speakers. Thank you, Dr. Dinwiddie. We really enjoyed your wealth of knowledge. And thank you so much, Judge, Judge Foy and Spencer Baca. So with that, thank you. Yeah.